Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for the invitation to talk. Uh, introduce another accent. Um, when I lived in America and people would say, that's an interesting accent, where are you from? And I'd say, I'm from the South. And they'd say, they'd think to themselves, probably Texas. You know? it's, fun, it's a funny enough accent. Um, so let's talk about something very different, uh, vaccines. So why, and, and just to, these are the group I'm talking on behalf of, so this is a lot of the work here, and particularly from the New Zealand group. Um, but why is, why is vaccination as an intervention uh, a really interesting option? Firstly, it's, it's routine. It's probably one of the most routine processes d done on animals. So fairly routine management. It should work across all ruminant species. Um, and we also expect that it would only need to be vaccinated on a few times. So again, when we talk about some of the interventions, you know, this is a, a pretty standard thing. And if we had a good vaccine, it'd be pretty easy to implement. So this is, um, I've used the FAO report. You heard some great data from the FAO report before. Um, they forgot to add vaccines to their list. So I've taken their data and added vaccines at the bottom there. So if you see the other interventions, then one of our problems, particularly with the inhibitors, is we're largely confined to intensive situ situations. And as people have said, most of the livestock actually aren't in intensive farming. So. This is where potentially if we could have a vaccine, it would come in. It's applicable to all of our production systems. And that's, that's the most important thing. Um, why, why put the effort in? Because we know that we could implement it quite easily if we had an effective vaccine. So I come out of industry. So the first thing you do when you start a project as distinct from academic is you actually write down what the product's gonna look like at the end. Uh, and then you work towards it. So product profile. And the important thing about this, if you don't actually know where you're going, it sort of can be hard to get there. So um, we convened a meeting last September in Dubai, uh, courtesy of the Gates Foundation. We brought together about 40 people from around the world to look at vaccines. Not because there's 40 people working on it. We actually had a meeting of people working on vaccines. We'd only really need a circular table here. But we brought in a lot of other people. We brought in industry people. We brought in sort of immunologists because we wanted to stimulate a conversation about how would we do this? What do we know? How would we do this? So let's, and, and we developed this product profile there. So here's the product profile. I can't read it all from the side here, but basically what does it look like? It's gonna be an inactivated vaccine. I'll talk about that a bit more. There's a lot of different vaccination strategies, but there's a reason why this would be an inactivated. Um, the idea is it's an aid in the reduction of methane. Why do you use that? Well, that's actually the terminology when you register a vaccine an aid in prevention of or an aid in, in doing something. Um, uh, cattle is the primary species we're looking at, it, but as I said, we think it would be applicable to, to all ruminant species, particularly if it worked in buffalo. If you look at something like uh, half the dairy herd in, in India is buffalo. Um, use existing adjuvants, that would make it a lot easier to register. Uh, can be delivered in combination. Most of our vaccination are combination vaccines. So not necessarily incorporating in the same bottle, but we could potentially give it at the same time. So I won't go through all of this detail, but this is the sort of thing that you write up to say, well, what would you want a vaccine to look like? The other one really important with vaccines is the dose. So we sort of said here, preferably two doses. So you might need to two doses as priming and then a sort of six monthly on an annual boost. Most vaccines are generally sort of an annual boost. Although if we could do a live attenuate, we, we can't in here, then obviously you don't need to give them as frequently. Um, we picked a figure of 30% reduction in methane. Don't, we, we really don't know, but we sort of picked a figure of saying, what would we sort of target? Uh, site is obviously safe. The major thing with vaccines is site reaction. So we'd say, hey, it shouldn't be anything worse than clostridials. Clostridial is about one of the worst vaccines in the sense of site reactions. And of course, you always sell the farmer. That shows the vaccine's working. Um, how long would it take? Um, so we, th we thought that a proof of concept or proof of principle would be about three years um, and a full registration uh, up to seven years. It's not gonna be a simple vaccine to develop. In the US, it's probably gonna be registered by the FDA because again, it's not a disease. Um, I was involved in registering one of the only vaccine that was registered by the FDA and that was Improvac for Bortain in pigs, it's not a disease, so FDA took it because we're reducing testosterone. 
If it was a disease, USDA would take it. And for some reason, FDA didn't think testosterone was a disease, but I think there's about 50% of the population probably says it is. Um, so that's what a product profile looks like. Okay, the types of vaccines. I said modified live. These are difficult organisms to grow. So that's probably why we're not going and manipulate. We don't even know how to manipulate them at the moment. We had a great conversation with the guys from IGI yesterday about the, the ability to do that in the future. But at the moment, we can't do that. Um, inactivated, again, if it's inactivated, you have to be able to grow it. And, and that's not particularly easy. The standard way to make a vaccine is grow it, kill it, adjuvant, and put in the animal. There's many vaccines that we've had around for years. We don't actually know exactly how they work, but they work, so that's fine. This is most likely going to be um, a killed antigen or, or a, uh, you know, it's not going to be a toxoid because uh, we don't, you know, like clostrials because we're not aware of any toxins that these organisms produce. Uh, I threw this one in because I made this slide about 20 years ago and when I went through my slide collection, I thought it's, it's actually still relevant. Because I was looking there at, you know, the beauty in the, in the veterinary space is we have lots of ways to deliver a vaccine. In the human health, until recently, it was largely a few. They, you know, mRNA came along. But, you know, mRNA may not, it's not even on the slide here because this is 20 years ago. But it's just one of the tools that you could use. But we've been using lots of things. We've been using vectors for a long time. Uh, we've got intranasal, transgenic plants. I mean, uh, Dow made the first transgenic plant vaccine probably a decade ago, uh, and now the, the Koreans have made one recently. Um, so there's all sorts of ways, once we know what sort of vaccine we want, there's all sorts of ways we can deliver it. Um, so this is the bad news. So why hasn't there been a vaccine? It's not because we didn't think about it until recently. You can see from the data here, this is 20 years ago publications from CSRO showing they had a, you know, a vaccine, pretty simple sort of uh, technology, you know, um, just whole antigens. Um, but it, it didn't work very well and it wasn't reproducible. The New Zealanders tried to go down that route and it wasn't reproducible. Um, also, they looked at recombinant antigens at that stage, what would you know, and they, they had no effect. So that was sort of realistically you know, not very promising. And the reality is no one was really interested other than the New Zealanders. You know, there just wasn't the momentum. You know, this room's got twice as many people in it as it had last year. The, gr the growth and the interest in this area is stimulating. So now people are quite interested, and I told you why they're interested in the vaccine approach. So this is how we think a vaccine should work, okay? We don't really know how it would work, but this is how we think it should work. If we can produce antibodies and in saliva, and the great news about that is the quantity of saliva that goes into a room in it, when you, you guys all know this, but when you tell a, a non-animal person that it's, you know, it's about 150 litres or something a day, it's a horrifying concept, but it's great for us because that would be our natural route to carry an antibody in. So we've got to produce an antibody response, draining it into the saliva, and then the saliva would carry it in to the rumen. The difficulty, of course, is the rumen is a immunologic and naive site. There is no immune tissue in the, in the rumen. So we've got to actually have it come in through the slide. How would the antibody work? Well, probably in the rumen, it's not going to work by a lot of the mechanisms. It's not going to be complement mediated. So we actually don't know, maybe agglutination. So it's one of the things we need to find out. How would an antibody actually work uh, once we got in there, there? And what would be the impact on the methanogens? This is a complex mix. You've heard this all the time. So just knocking out one, you know, they're just going to grow around it. So how many do we need to knock out to be effective? So again, this is some of the d data from the New Zealanders, um, and this is the promising data. So in, at least in in vitro system, if you make a polyclonal um, sera against uh, a methanogen, you can ac actually get reduction in growth in the methanogens in vitro and you can actually get a reduction in methane production in vitro. So this is the, the good news, that in an in vitro system, antibodies will recognise, they will bind, and you will have an effect. And probably the most interesting is this slide here, the photo here, with the antibodies agglutinating. That might tell us something about what's going on. So you can see the pre-immune antibodies here, 
but we're getting an agglutination. Is that's what is that what is going to actually happen? They're agglutinated and then they may be flushed out of, out of the rumen. We actually don't know, but that's one of the things we'll we'll find out. Um, so these are some of the other things that we do know. So anti as I said, we can get antibodies to surface proteins. We expect that's probably the target, go after surface proteins. They're relatively stable. So that was another question. Are antibodies going to be stable? So they're relatively stable for a couple of hours in rumen fluid. We also know the quantity of antibody. So they've, they've done some calculations here. And you can produce a fair bit of antibody to get carried in by the saliva. So that's the sort of good news. Uh, again, here is another thing that's going to be really important is the typical immune response, you make a, a huge response, and then as it deals with the pathogen, the immune response comes down. This is going to have to be turned on continuously. So we're going to have to make a high antibody response, and it's going to have to hang in there. So this is data showing that you can actually get a reasonably persistent antibody response, and then you can boost it um, six months later. But of course, you see at the start, it was three doses at the start. So again, if you think back to that product profile, we'd prefer to get away with just two doses. That's the standard protocol for a killed vaccine. You need two doses to prime. We don't know about the age of animals. Wouldn't it be great if we had that effect early in the age of animals and maybe get that sort of persistent response? Um, this is a complex slide, but basically what it says is, this is also good news, is that despite how complex the rumen is, it's reasonably well conserved. It's well, well conserved across species and across the globe. So there's a fair few organisms. So what they did in this study was make antibodies, polyclonal antibodies, to four species. And then they bound them to beads, and then they asked the question, what do they recognise? And the answer was, they recognise themselves, Obviously, that's really good. But they actually were cross-reactive. They recognised cross-reactive epitopes in a range of methanogenic organisms. So that's what you really hope for. Otherwise, you know, how many antigens would we have to have in a vaccine? We don't know the answer to that. But this is good news, that there are cross-reactive epitopes across these organisms. Again, what, uh, what are the gaps in the knowledge? This was one of the things we pursued in, in Dubai then, and again in November we, ha we had another convening at the International Immunology Meeting in um, uh, South Africa. Um, so what are, the first what are the first organisms actually recognised? You know, we do know that, that micro you know, methane engines are naturally recognised. So what are those first ones? What, are, what is being recognised? Um, what, what effect would we have vaccination? Um, what's the interaction with the innate part of the immune system? Uh, the surface structures. So again, we know we're pro probably, you know, we've got a lot of sequence data, but we're probably going to need to actually understand some structural biology to understand how to make a really effective vaccine. Um, and what if, you know, what if we could actually vaccinate the, the mother or the dam and have the antibody transferred? Um, that might be a, a really effective way. So we've kicked off a couple of projects. The Basos Foundation uh, has generously come in and supported the hub. Uh, and this is one of the projects we've kicked off. You can see the authors there. This is Dirk Welling at the Royal Vet School and, uh, and David uh, out of Spain. So the question they're trying to answer here is, when you look at the coevolution of the rumen and the immune system, what's going on? At what stage, you know, do they start talking to each other? What are the first organisms? What are the first antigens that are recognised? It was really interesting talking with the IGI guys. They're doing some similar sort of work. So we're going to, again, we're going to get together and share in, the, in this space because this is going to be tough work to do. So you can sort of see, you know, isolating organisms in vitro growth. But this is trying to look at that, the basics of the coevolution of these two important systems, the rumen and the immune system, and how they work together. This is the other project, and this is John Hammond out of Purbright with, uh, with Neil and Peter from Ag Research. You've done a lot of the antigen work. Um, and basically, um, with John Hammond's work, he can define antibodies down to a single cell. So taking a single cell and starting asking the question, what antibody does that, that, that cell, B cell, produce? What's the avidity? What isotype it is? 
So this is, again, fairly fundamental work. And you can see the list of questions up there, which I won't read out because, you know, from the side here, I can't actually read the text, which is always interesting. Um, but there's a raise of questions, fairly fundamental questions that are going to be addressed uh, in, the, in this uh, particular project. These are some of the tools in John's group. Particularly, I'd call out the fact that this single cell sorting, being able to sort cells, live cells, and, and actually work with those and work out what an individual cell is telling us, rather than, you know, generally in immunology, it's quite crude. We take serum and we ask the question, what's, what is the antibodies in the serum? Here, we're actually going to ask, what are individual B cells recognizing? What's the isotype? You know, people say, oh, it's a mucosal, so it's probably IgA that you need. We don't know. And IgA is not that easy to induce. So, again, the answer here is what's the isotype, what sort of the VDD, et cetera, is going to come out of this project. And then, of course, once we've got that, to actually then we can actually do epitope mapping. We can do structural biology. Okay, this is the earlier deck. So, uh, sorry, Colin, your slide that you gave me at 6.30 this morning is not in there. Um, but the other group to, to call out is Arkea is the new one of the new groups on the, uh, on the block. You may have seen that they've recently raised a fair bit of capital. Um, uh, so they're having a crack at this, particularly looking at uh, what antigens uh, in vivo work. So again, it's great to see the interest that's being now expressed in looking at the approach to vaccine. And Colin is here somewhere, and I'm sure he can talk to you. There he is. Uh, can talk to you in more detail about sort of the work that Arkea is going to do. But it's great to have him on board. And again, um, the whole idea in this thing is, is that we start sharing the sort of things. What sort of assay systems we use? How do we do in vivo studies? Um, and again, you know, this is going to be a tough project. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I love this saying because the reality is when you're a scientist, people always tell you why it won't work, you know? You know, I managed to, to, to crack a problem down from 100 years by being young enough and naive enough not to listen to people. So again, you know, the answer here is we're not naive. We know how challenging this is, but this is worth having a go at. Uh, a lot of people involved. So great to see the new funding coming in. As I said, this is largely for a decade now been left to New Zealanders. Uh, and now they've been joined by a whole group of people, including the Methane Hub, including Basos, to come in and support additional work in this really challenging but really exciting area. So thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions.